Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing so well. It's a beautiful day, a wonderful day for a Crawl Space episode. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing just fine, Lance. And Lance, in this episode, we talk to two really amazing women. It's Marie and Rosie, and their sister, Betty Connolly, was murdered back in 1993. Right. And Betty's case came to our attention because of this viral video that featured Betty's daughter, Linda. Now, Linda's a photographer, Linda Connolly. She's a photographer. She had a uh, colleague and a friend, Leanne Fivey, and Leanne wanted to make documentaries. She wanted to get into the documentary filmmaking biz and asked Linda, do you know any story that we can look at? Uh, to to uh, you know make a make a film about and Linda said yeah I got a story and it's her mom her mom was shot at 3 a.m. in a convenience store while she was working it was a senseless murder and uh, it's unsolved and this video that Leanne made is amazing we'll put the link to it it features Linda it features Linda's dad it features the location and it's beautiful and it took off and we talked to Linda a couple of weeks ago and she hooked us up with this interview and I absolutely love these women yeah they're great Lance and we had Linda on our get vocal show a few weeks ago as well and I believe we're going to bring that audio to the crawl space uh, podcast feed as well um, very soon but yeah th- so this was uh, this is Linda's aunts Marie and Rosie Betty's sisters and uh, it's a really emotional interview and it's re- it's really great to talk to them isn't it yeah and they they started off with a picture they have this large picture of Betty in between the two of them so when we first started the zoom call uh, we saw the two of them and we saw this wonderful picture of Betty between them and they got a little emotional. They laughed a bit. I mean, they're they're really, um, you know, if you were to just hang out with them, you'd probably have a blast. You know, you'd probably play cards and just have a blast or something. They, they reminded me of like my aunts. You know, they reminded me of people I knew in my family. They're so relatable. And yeah, it did get a little emotional, but... Uh, that emotion really comes through in a way where they want justice. You know, it's been too long and it's 27 years later and they need this. And yeah, it builds up and it also shows the secondary victims that we talk about 27 years later and they're, they still are, you know, like bubble over with emotion, uh, anger, uh, grief. It's still there. Yeah, it still is. And Lance, during this interview, we actually learned some some new things about the case that kind of uh, staggered us, I will say. And so uh, we don't want to give it away here in the intro, but uh, but give it a listen and uh, see if you can tell what kind of throws us back because it is a clue that, um, I don't know, I guess we, we weren't really expecting. Yeah, Linda did not set us up for that one, and it certainly did take us by surprise, and it's important. All right, everybody, thanks a lot for listening. Follow us on Twitter and give us five stars on your favorite podcast listening app. Or four. I mean, I'll take four. No, five. There's eight of us. So, and now we're speaking with uh, Marie and Rosie, and uh, and your Betty Betty Connolly's sisters. Yes. Right. Okay. Wow, that's a big family. Oh, it was. So, so there's just Rose and I left, you know, due to health reasons. Mm-hmm. And Betty, Betty was our our support group. Oh, if, definitely. <laughs> If uh, either one of us or any of us, uh, any of the eight, if we were having a problem, Betty somehow knew something was wrong. She would end up calling us and, and saying, I'm having this feeling, something something's not right. Well, I just want to thank you two for joining us. I know it's going to be uh, a difficult conversation to have, and I, I think we want to focus a little bit on that um, as we get into the conversation. Uh, you came to us by way of Linda Conley, who is your your niece. That's correct? Right. Yes. Correct. And Linda Conley was 17 years old. We had her on the show a few weeks ago. Uh, She was 17 years old in 1993, July 8th, 1993, when her mother, uh, Betty Conley, who you just spoke about, and you have the wonderful picture there between the two of you, uh, she was she was murdered and her. Uh, the, her killer has not been caught yet, and she was murdered at a convenience store at about 3 in the morning uh, in Saratoga County of Charlton, small town of Charlton, New York, and all over $100 that was stolen out of the register. 
Um, it is, is a tragic story. Uh, it's 27 years old, and started well, to... actually, actually, it's 27 years, seven weeks, and three days and nine hours. Wow. Yeah. See, this is what we wanted to get into when we spoke to to Linda. This. Um, cold case has had a resurgence because Linda's friend uh, and colleague, they're both photographers, uh, Leanne Fivey, she wanted to start, uh, I guess, like dipping her toes in the documentary film um, business and uh, or, or trade or craft. And she asked Linda if she had a story that she knew of that she could maybe... Uh, you know, test out her abilities on, and and Linda said, "Yeah, my my the story of my mother, uh, your sister." And the video that was uh, released is just a few minutes long, and it's beautifully shot, and it features features Linda, it features Linda's father, and it shows Linda going back to the scene of the crime, and and the just the emotion in that video is incredible. And it, it blew up. It, uh, I was we were Tim and I were talking about it. And I don't think I've ever seen a video like that since we've been doing this podcast. Like since we've been doing true crime podcasting, we've seen sort of testimonial videos and uh, advocate videos, but I don't think they expected it to blow up the way it blew up. But yeah, it just goes back to what you said. Like you have it down to the day, and Linda has it down to the day. And Rose, I'm sure you have it down to the day, and and I'm sure I'm sure uh, Linda's dad does too. And it's not just you; it's everybody affected by everybody affected by cases like this, where there's no resolution and it's just fallen off the uh, priority uh, ladder. So I'm gonna stop babbling, but you just inspired me with with uh, with that. Um, and uh, so yes, thank you for coming on. Well, we were really glad that Linda could pull herself together to do that, you know, to go to the store. We have, I have not been able to. So we're going to see how Saturday goes. It's going to be a get together. Oh, really? So we're hand yeah. out signs. Wow. A uh, hundred okay. signs was, was made and we're going to post them all around. That's great. And um, so, how how close are you then to that store to have um, you know not gone by it? Oh, oh, there's ways around it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's right on the corner of Peaceable Street and Route 67, mm -hmm. right by the fire department. But yeah. there is a way around. I we know ways. <laughs> Good. All okay. Right, we, we we won't ask any questions. And you're you're doing this on Saturday of this week. Yes, around one o'clock, and so we're hoping that quite a few people show up. Wow. Um, well, we will uh, put that out on on social as as much as we can. We will support that as much as we can on social. And you're going to be handing out flyers. What are these flyers going to uh, say? It ends up giving a background of uh, Betty and. Um, well, what sun. happened, what, what we know that happened, or w what we've been told that happened. Signs to put in the ground alongside the road, you know, like your voting signs. Yep. I'm going to try to bring it up. I can try to show it to you. Um, brain work. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, can you take us back to uh, your, you know, growing up and, and what the family was like? You said you had a large family, part of eight siblings, I think you said. Uh, can you just give us a, a sense of the family dynamic um, before the horrible events of July 8th? I don't know if you can see it. This is oh, yeah. the oh, only yeah. picture taken of us eight kids together. No way. Really? When was that taken? That was back in... Oh, gosh. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny was a baby, so... Probably 61, maybe? 1961. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. We, our, our mom was not well. Um, I, I was five, six years old. My mom and my da our dad's uh, family ended up taking one or two of us, and they brought us up. But the funny part of it is, is as we got older, we 
started calling each other and connecting. We we lived in the town in the the area of Bernox. It's a small town. Um, it it was it was different for when we were young. We didn't get together, but as we got older, we were able to. You know, we started driving or riding bikes. You know, we got to know each other. Right. So we really didn't know each other until we started getting about 10 years old and up. I don't know. Can you see that? That's the flyer. Well, it's a sign. The signs. Yes. Okay. That's uh, who killed Bel Betty Connolly uh, from Facebook. Yes. There was, uh, there's this funny story when we were started in school. Uh, Rose ended up telling me about it. She used to come home from school off the bus. And her and Betty would climb up in the trees. <laughs> we were being bad then. <laughs> they were, they would, that was their hiding place. So they would hide up there and smoke. They pull out their cigarettes and start smoking. <laughs> oh, well, at least, it, at least they were cigarettes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't know what that stuff was. We were too 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 far back <laughs> um with as we got older like i said betty and i lived close enough and we're talking in the 70s the early 70s betty and bruce were married and all of she had all of us sisters in her wedding we were her maids of honor <laughs> and um they got an apartment down in uh Schenectady. I lived in Colony, so so there there's a big difference. There's there's I don't know maybe five five seven miles difference between Schenectady and uh, Colony. Well, our both our husbands, my husband at the time, worked a second shift. So Betty and I tried to figure out how we could get together. Well, Betty <laughs> Betty was the one she says let's just hitchhike so back in the early 70s her and i would hitchhike back and forth to, to go see each other at our apartments i went to see her the one day and we started walking to your house <laughs> and the thing that betty always said if we're going to hitchhike you have to remember to always sit in the back seat you sit in the back seat so if you have to jump out of the car if somebody's not being nice to you it was better to be in the back seat and sit by the door. <laughs> well, that that is a thrifty thing to say, and I, I have to imagine that is true. Uh, wow, what a different time. What, I know what, it. I know it. What year was that? That was in the early 70s because, uh, believe it or not, Betty and I got pregnant at the same time. So, Lynn, I have twin girls. Linda is only three days older than my two. So we used to go camping. <laughs> and of course, I, I was sitting with Betty and I was telling her, look, at, I, I'm really upset because I love sleeping on my stomach, but you can't sleep on your stomach when you're six months pregnant. <laughs> so we went camping and we're, I'm sitting there talking to Betty and she says, you know what? I have a good idea. How about if we dig a hole in the sand Put the towel down. We can lay on our bellies. You two look like gophers. <laughs> <laughs> we we laid on. I said that. It felt so good. I didn't even think we fell asleep. I, I don't know if you fell asleep, but you look like gophers. I see that sand flying everywhere. <laughs> oh, when we were trying to dig the holes. Yes. So then uh, it came time for, for <coughs> Betty to have Linda because I was... Um, due three weeks later than her, my due date. So Betty goes into the maternity hospital to have Linda. So the next day I go up to see <laughs> Betty. Well, it just so happened I went into labor at the same time. I was three weeks early. So I said, Betty, it's all your fault. I'm not supposed to be ha having the girls yet. <laughs> she says, that's because I want you to be in the room with me. So I ended up going into the hospital. I had my two, and we were in the same maternity room together. 
first time ever, Bellevue at, Maternity. At the hospital. So we are connected. Yeah, that's quite a bonding experience. Jesus. <laughs> okay. So so uh, you, you both were in the same uh, room together, the maternity room together. You, you were both, and it was just a couple of days apart? Yeah. Wow. Linda's due, the, due in, uh, was due the end of September, and my two were born October 2nd. Wow. And was it a, was it a close extended family as well? Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. A, a extended Linda. family and how? Well, I guess my question is, um, did, did Linda get along with, um, with, with your children and, and, uh, like was, were, were they close? <laughs> she had no choice because Betty and I would go camping after the girls were born six months, both the, uh, the three girls were, uh, six months old. Betty packed up. It's an old fashioned playpen. It was wooden. She'd pack that playpen up and we would go camping with the three girls and we always put them into the playpen so we could keep track of them. <laughs> and, and yes, Linda and, and my girls got along good till they got older. And, and right. as, as they got older, Betty and I um, always ended up making sure that uh, we had our birthday parties different times. We didn't want to take away from either one of them. And we did the same thing for graduation. The, the year that Betty was murdered, we had planned on making sure that um, she could come to my daughter's graduation and I would be able to make Linda's graduation. So, uh, the graduation day that I came up here to, um, for Linda's, um, my now husband and I were going to go camping, but we, I told Betty we would stop in and hang out. So I have, uh, the memories that that, that was not a good year, even if it was the year for, for our kids to graduate. She had made that comment to me because of Joyce and Mace. She said, I have a feeling 93 is not a good year. The graduation was planned for earlier that year, probably May or June? No, it, no, was, it was July. July. Oh, really? Yeah. Linda's graduation um, party was the weekend before before Betty was murdered. Just the weekend before. Yeah. We had the graduation. It was on, on a Saturday. And we were, uh, my husband and I, Pete and I, were heading out camping. So we're standing in the backyard at, you know, while the party's going on. And Betty is talking to me. And I'm telling her where we're going to go. And there was a place that we used to always go with our father, and that was caught up at Moffat Speech, which was Speculator. So she was giving me stuff, you know, here, take this in light rain. So she gave us a big sheet of plastic, and, and I said, I forgot, the, I forgot the clothespins. So she handed me a whole brand new package of clothespins <laughs> to hang up our wet stuff. And uh, she says, you know what? She says, um, I'll be up. I'll come up and see you. So uh, we went up, my husband and I went up, we were tenting. We went up to Moffitt's Beach. Well, it was the 4th of July weekend. So when we got to Moffitt's Beach, there was no openings. So they said that their overflow was going up to Pasico Lake, which is another place It's not that far. But they don't have showers, so you'll have to come back down to Moffitt's to take showers. So a couple of days, we're up there camping. All of a sudden, I, I well, I said to my husband, I got to go down and take a shower. So we went back down to Moffitt's Beach. Well, back then, you didn't have, have cell phones. So I couldn't call her, and we didn't know exactly what day Betty was coming up to see us. She was coming up with Jeremiah. She said... You know, I'll be up. So I went, uh, we went down to Moffitt's Beach to take our shower. So I'm in, in the shower. All of a sudden, I hear this voice. And <laughs> I'm like, a kind voice. I'm like, 
<laughs> Betty, is that you? She's, she says, yeah. The thing was, they would have never told her, even if she stopped at the gate and said, we're looking for my sister Marie, they wouldn't have put two and two together because they don't keep track of that stuff, not back then. So if it was the perfect timing and it was something that was meant to be, because that was the last time that I saw Betty. She made it a point to come see you, see me. It was that week that she was murdered, that Thursday. So every day I just thank God that she had it in her. She just knew. I knew it was just a coincidence that she happened to be at the same spot that you kind of randomly said, I, I need to go take a shower, and, and she was down there at the same time. She just got there trying to see if we were there camping and they would have if they would have said no we don't have anybody by that name they wouldn't have you know had it in their heads that we were up the road at another place which was probably i don't know maybe about 10 miles away oh wow and wow. that was about an hour's drive so i'm sure she had to use the ladies room immediately yeah when she got there <laughs> And we were sitting, um, then she, then we went up to our, our campsite and we're sitting around the picnic table and she ended up telling me that, she, that there was this guy that came into the store that made her very uncomfortable. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she says, he was asking her all kinds of questions. He was asking her about the camera, which was behind her. He was asking her if she was there alone. Betty says, yeah, the, cam the camera works. You know, she knew enough to fib. And he says, are you here alone? And she said, no, there's someone in the back. And she's telling me this, and it had happened a couple of days before she came up to see us. And she described the guy to me. But you got to realize, 27 years ago, I do remember what she said. And, uh, yeah. And um, she uh, said that he made her very uncomfortable. And I said, well, Betty, why, uh, why are you working that, the third shift? Because I said, you never worked that shift. And she said, because she was covering the shift for another girl, had something else going on. Well, she took on that shift. Because we were telling her that she shouldn't right. be working overnight. And she said, I feel safe because the firemen are right next door. The police are in here all the time getting their coffee. And I have friends that drop in all the time checking on me. I'm good. And she said, if anybody ever comes in to, to rob me, I'll give them the money and a sandwich to go. That's a uh, really fascinating that she had seen this person. I'm assuming this is the, I'm assuming we're all thinking that this is the person that committed the crime, right? Who she was talking about. Yeah, we think so yeah. because she had talked to another friend and there was something that Betty was going to do. And she had told me she would do it. And, um, when I ended after she was murdered, it was weeks after I went to, um, Bruce had gone with me because I, I, I couldn't do it alone. Bruce took me and we went to the sheriff's department and I was talking to the investigator and I asked him the question and... I didn't know how you knew, huh? Yep. He says, how do you know? And I says, because Betty told me that this was what she was going to do. And that was the man that was, had come in and you're doing great. <laughs> she knew, she knew what was going to happen. Can you imagine how she felt at that time? Knowing when that guy came in, that that was going to be her last and there's people out there that know this. Now is the time to just come forward. It's been long enough. They need to clear their, their minds, their souls, whatever it is. It's time. We miss her awful. 
had she ever seen this person before the time that she described to you? Did she say that he was, um, you know, maybe once a week or something he would come in? Or? No, she just said it was a couple of times and each time he would ask questions and it just made her uncomfortable. Did, uh, did she ever mention what kind of car that person was driving? She didn't say anything about a car. Okay. So, so you think this was directly related to something that she was going to report? I don't I think to... so. I, I don't think know. She just was watching her back as much as she could. Because it was only a couple of times. We don't know if she even said anything to the owner of the store, the manager. We don't even know that. And you had mentioned that she said that she told the person that the camera was functioning. Uh, was a camera always recording? Did they have any chance? Back then, what it was was a, a video camera that if the boss was in the office in the back, then he could keep an eye out front by the register. But nobody at that time, there, there wasn't anybody in, in the store. Right. There wasn't any recording on, on like a tape or anything. But the, the person that murdered her didn't know that because she told him yes. So the camera was knocked down. He got, he somehow knocked it down on the floor. The camera was connected to the office. So if somebody was in the office, they could watch what was going on out there. But obviously at three in the morning, there was no one in the office, right? No. You mentioned that, um, that she, uh, would have known this person. So I, I guess I'm, I think I'm missing something here on, uh, on why uh, she or how she would have uh, expected violence from this person at that moment. Okay, we, we were told that her back was to the counter when he was in the store, I think, I want to say the first time. And he got an item and slammed it on the counter and it made her jump. And then when he fired all the questions at her, and she told him, you know, the police are in here all the time. And she, she told him the same thing. But why would anybody slam something down on the counter? You know, scared the bejeebers out of you when you wasn't facing them. And that's what, you know, sent the hairs up on her neck. I mean, the, the population of that town is very, very small. It was very, very small then. And this person went there on one night to and, and scared her intentionally and then returned several nights later this person must be known in this town this person has to has but then uh, when uh, we were talking to the sheriff's department and the investigators at the time they said that we needed to understand that it's a wider because you have um 87 the north way that runs up and down and there's an exit, you know, it's quite a few miles down the road, but they would come, you know, eight, the big truckers would come through there and everything because uh, 67 is one of the bigger highways for, for heavy traffic as far as, you know, the big trucks and people getting from one point to the other point. But yes, she, uh, she it's small. Did she give you an idea of what this person's age might have been? It was, um, she, she told a friend of hers. She really described him pretty good to her friend. And she, she had said to yeah. me that he was, um, she had said to me that he was between 20 and 30. Hmm. Okay. Well, that kind of fits with the description. Do you know, did, does that, does, the description of that person or that car um, sound familiar to you? No. No. It might have been just somebody that popped in and just was, you know, checking things out. We were thinking he might have even been sitting there for, for a couple of days, you know, back and forth and might have been, you know, casing the place. But that's all hearsay. You know, that's just us. You, you just said that he might have been casing the store, uh, which made me think of any other crimes that have taken place in the area. If he's casing that store, I'm sure he probably at some point was casing other stores. Did the police 
inform you about any other crimes or were there any other crimes around that time? The police never came to, to me because I don't know why, because I had a lot to say. They, you know, didn't, they, they, they didn't they, question any of they us. They didn't question any of us. It was, it was weeks after that I was on Bruce's case to say, you know, Bruce, I'd really like to go in and talk to them. They're, they're not calling me. I, I, and it was just the weekend before, it was 4th of July weekend. She was murdered on the 8th. That was the same week. But no, the, nobody ever, none of the investigators, nobody ever came to any of us to even ask us any questions if she, if we even talked. I mean, we're sisters, we did talk. And I was very close to her. There's only a year difference between Betty and I. And the, I mean, I could have told him right up front. I mean, I was there when Betty met Bruce. And it was love at first sight. You know, I, I could have told him that they were it barking wasn't. up the wrong tree with Bruce. Right. My heart was broken for, for our brother-in-law. Because we knew, we knew the love that they had between the two of them. Jesus, it blows my mind that the police never brought the family together to ask them questions about this. I get it. It's a small town and all that. But I mean, really, are they that like overrun with violent crimes that they just couldn't keep up with all of the all of the investigations going on simultaneously uh, in the early weeks of July of 93 that they couldn't? I'm sorry. No. It was I'm... six months, six months before an officer, and I met him in the Kmart parking lot because I lived up in Bern at that time. I met him in the parking lot, and it was six months later. I mean, and, right, we don't live up this way, but Bruce knows all, our, all of our numbers. He would have, you know, yeah. given it to him. And I kept saying to Bruce, why aren't they calling me? They it's, never it, called any of us. It's unbelievable. I mean, you, you might not have lived in the area, but what, like, what, what is stopping them from calling you? What is stopping them from actually performing an investigation or at least reaching out to the local police department in your area? We and kept calling them. To, to your point, Rose... You, you, you were aware at how in love her husband and her were, Bruce and her were, and and it was love at first sight. But you know, when these investigations start, it's always the it's always the 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 spouse that they look at. It's always the close the close family members that they look at, and for them to not even reach out and say, "Hey, what do you know what their relationship was like?" Like that blows my mind. Right, and and we were there. We were up there as soon as we found out that same day. We went up there. We wanted to support Bruce. We knew that it was going to be hard on Linda and Jeremiah. And we wanted to be there because we cared about them. We're family. And, and Bruce was a wonderful husband. And we knew it was not going to be easy on him. And Be Betty introduced me to my husband now. And she kept saying, when you move up here. And I'm like, no, because I don't want nothing to do with a man at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if she only knew I lived two doors down from where she lived. Right now. Yep. No and way. She married the, she married yeah. the guy that Betty introduced her to. Yep. And she kept saying he's the one. Yep. He's the wow. one. <laughs> it sounds like there was really something special about Betty and uh Absolutely. So many people loved her. Really. I I, I mean, had I had wrote a little thing um, because in memory of Betty, we've we've done bricks uh, in the crime victims area down at the Albany um, County Courthouse. Um, I've had a rose planted in her name at the um, Central Park uh, in Schenectady. And um, I had wrote this little thing. There was a, a news uh, reporter that had we had gotten together with, with uh, crime victims. Uh, I was in a, a member of a group. It was the POMC, which is Parents of Murdered Children. We all needed support at that time. We needed, you know, somebody to understand what we were going through. And this is what I ended up writing. 
Betty Conley had numerous qualities that made her such a special person. But speaking as her sister, the one that stands out the most relate to her personality. She had this natural way of attracting, helping people with any and all of their problems. I guess I can best relate her to a beautiful butterfly dancing from petal to petal with this light, airy beauty and elegance. Thus, in doing so, what was so natural for Betty ultimately benefited others whom her life touched. You can be sure if we were unhappy or down, Betty made us see the good in life and she herself always there to pick us up or help you to carry the burden of life. She had a unique way of always putting her own needs aside and making you feel like you were always the most important person. She made all of us feel as special, important as needed as the butterfly which dances through our favorite gardens. Her beauty and grace had this special magic, something only Betty could possess. She was like a special promise that after every storm, there would be a rainbow and she made you search for it. The children Betty Conley, ha or Betty has left behind are also blessed with the same qualities that their mother possessed. She made them feel important and taught them to hold their heads high in any situation because deep inside each of their warm, caring heart lives a little spirit of their mom. It has been 27 years, seven weeks, three days, and nine years today since a murderer extinguished that gentle, beautiful, butterfly-spirited person, my sister Betty. No longer can she be there physically for those who loved her so deeply. We are only left with our memories. The murderer walks free, yet today, free to murder again. They had no knowledge that she was more than a simple victim of his horrific crime. She was a wife, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a daughter, a cousin, and a best friend to so many. Until this individual is brought to justice for what they did, we can only keep the spirit of Betty alive in our memories and in our heart. By doing these things in life that would make Betty proud, we can keep her gentleness close to our hearts to fly free as a butterfly in our gardens of our own lives. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's really nice. She was really a wonderful, special person. And we miss her awful. It has been 27 years, and we still miss her the same. What do you think she would be doing now? What what like, type of profession do you think she would have? She was going to go to college to become a horticultural. She loved she working in flowers. Yep. And Linda told you about the story about her bringing uh, flats of flowers out to my house. And while I burn, we have a lot of family in the, the cemetery out there. So we went out and we put flowers on everybody's grave out there. And then she noticed that there was a lot of graves that looked like they hadn't been visited in a long time. So that's what we did. We got rid of all her flowers by planting them on everybody else's. <laughs> That's amazing. So she uh, had a bit of a green thumb. Oh, she had our grandmother's yes. green thumb. Yeah. Oh boy. All she had to do was look at it and it would grow. <laughs> <laughs> and how many jobs did she have? I know Linda told us, I think, how many jobs she had. Did she have like three jobs at the time? Four, actually. Is it possible to have four jobs? Yes. Oh, she did it. Yes. We did it. She was cleaning houses. She worked at the greenhouse next door. That was her favorite. Worked she at worked Chuck's. at Chuck's and she worked at Cock and Bull. Oh, and the, the store. Yeah. Five. Five she was juggling. My gosh. 
Oh yeah, we can be a little ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the way we grew up, we knew that if we wanted it, we, we had, had to, to do work. it and we had to go for it. Yeah. Uh, is there any new investigation that's happening or did the old investigation, um, did it, has any new investigator reached out to you recently? Oh, no. Um, the other day well, I did get a call, but it was because Linda had called the investigator. He's a new investigator on the case right now. And he did call me and, and I gave him what information I had. And I asked him, I said, so, so what kind of, uh, um, speculations what's you know but what's going on but you know they can't tell all he said is what you, the information you have given me is something that's real the other stuff kind of has been hearsay but what i told him was not hearsay it was exactly what betty as best as i can remember it was exactly what betty had told me that day up at camp so the the first time you told the police that was 27 years later no, I, when, when Bruce and I had gotten together, which was weeks after her murder, um, I, Bruce went with me and we went in to talk to the investigator. Okay, so, good. So, but that was the old investigator. Right. Now there's new, new investigators on the case. Young, he says, you know, there's a young group. We've been there numerous times and we kind of get the same answer, you know? Yep. Yeah. We're working on it. Every time that something comes up, we check it all out. And the uh, description that you gave the investigators back then where you volunteered that information to them, because they, you, you went to them voluntarily, right? It's not like they called you in to get information, right? So that information, that description, and the one that you gave recently, uh, you've pretty much seared in your memory based on what Betty told you. Um, what, what was the description? I mean, you, you kind of did, is there anything more detailed than what you gave here or, or do you not want to give any more description here? I, you know, with the investigation, I, I don't know how much I'm able to give. You know, I don't want to yeah. be the one to mess it up if they finally, but they, you know, you don't know how much you can say. Right, right. That, yeah, that's understandable. Best to be uh, careful in that case. But we're but hoping. Is... With the new technology and everything, we're really hoping that this is going to, you know, like Linda says, the person, the person that murdered her didn't just keep it to himself. He, he had to have talked to someone and that's mm. what we're hoping and praying is that person has a conscience and, and you know, realizes now is the time. Now is the time to go ahead, and open is, up. This is like, it's all fresh for us. You know, like it happened all over again. So we're kind of hoping that with them, you know, that conscious is, is being bothered also. Well, yeah, I certainly, I certainly hope it would be. If, if not, maybe the person that the that this person told, maybe a family member or something. Uh, if the individual themselves doesn't have it in them, you know, doesn't have the capacity to feel that, maybe somebody around them that knows does, and and will say something. Um, what did this? This must have uh, been. Dev I mean, this obviously was devastating for your family. Uh, can you can you describe a little bit of that? What what was it like? I mean, hearing that and then having to deal with that in the in the in the immediate aftermath. Well, we remember it was a very hot day. It was it was oh, awful, uh, awful. Yeah. And, and we um, got together up at Betty and Bruce's because we wanted to be there for Bruce. And we sat, we sat outside and this, it was so hot. It was, you know, the sweat was pouring off of us. And you know what I just remembered? The day of her funeral, when we went back to their house, the trees or uh, there, were, there was a, a cloud or trees or something that made a big heart. Yeah, I remember, remember that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> there was a big heart in the sky. That's another way that yep. she would try to send us a message. And we just rallied yep. around Bruce. We just, you know, we just wanted him to know that we, uh, we understood, we were feeling our pain, but we knew that him and Jeremiah and Linda were, cheering, were having their pain too. And we just wanted to, to let him know that we loved him and we, 
supported them and well, I see Bruce all the time, at least like three three times a week. You know, we're we're still friend family. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. How's he uh how's he holding up? I know he was in the video that uh Linda's video and I mean your heart just breaks looking at him. He doesn't even have to open his mouth. Your heart just breaks looking at him. How how is he doing? He is he was raised that Boys don't cry. Boys have got to be tough. So he he does his falling apart when by himself. He calls me a crybaby all the time. <laughs> you know, no, no, nothing wrong with shedding some tears. Sometimes you got to let it out. Oh, we do. <laughs> I think it's uh, incredible that you remember how hot it was the day that you uh, heard about this and. I think, uh, you know, anyone who's listening who, if the person is listening and if, or somebody who that person has told is listening, I mean, look at, look at the effects of this. I mean, you remember, I don't remember the weather two weeks ago. You know, I don't, you, you remember how, how hot it was that day. You, and yeah, that whole week was in the nineties. Yeah. She, uh, yeah. at her, at her, uh, funeral, there was, over 400 people, their people were down the standing in line in this hot, the 90 yep. degrees weather, standing in line to come into the church just to walk past her. It was a small church just to walk past and give their support. And, you know, she touched many for, for such a small town. She touched so many people. Well, she even helped build the uh, play yard at the school. They build a, a wooden play yard for them, you know, for the school. And she was right in there. <laughs> That's something we always, <laughs> we always were. Are these signs that you're going to be putting up on Saturday going to stay there as, as long as possible? Is there some Absolutely. sort of permanent? And we'll and, also you know, bring them and put them in our yard too. So when people go by they can see it and and try to connect and i know uh facebook has reached as far as florida tennessee i'm trying to think of texas uh, and california we have a lot of all over friends and family that are spread across the united states because you never know where this guy is that's true yeah, keep sharing that video, and, and that goes to all of our listeners. Please share that video. Share this as you're listening to this. Please do. And, you know, this this year has been, like, so so crappy enough. Like, it would be really it'd be really nice for something uh, to come out of, out of this, at, at least. You know, some, some solid lead, something where you can kind of wrap, wrap your hands around and say this is a tangible lead someone has come forward and finally does done something right and just you know do something right like i i i'm with you all on this like there's this person who did it could not have done this with and kept their mouth shut it's someone knows they they it's it's too just the attitude in the in the behavior if it was the same person that she had described to you from a couple of nights before a few nights before that that type of behavior is is too brazen and too loud it's too, like to keep to themselves it's just not that personality trait so just do something right if you know just it can be anonymous you know you could just figure out a way to do this right they can get a hold of the uh, saratoga uh, sheriff department and just call anonymous like you said you know you don't have to give a name you you know just say well i do know something and give the information that you know yeah, it can be worked out. You can talk to the police anonymously. You you know, they you can do that. You can do it over the phone anonymously and I mean if you give enough proof that you know and you can and they can connect it and there can be this this evidence, this connective evidence, then then they'll have reason to go knock on someone's door. And uh we felt so good knowing that extra mart is is still back in their 10 10 10,000 Ten thousand yeah. dollar reward. Yeah. That is yeah. really that. We are so appreciative of them. Oh, that's great to hear. That 
Yeah. You would think after 27 years that they would just let it go, but. Oh, no, Linda tracked him down. Yeah. Yeah. Linda, Linda's a, a force. Seriously. She, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, she, she takes after both of her parents. Uh, you know, there's a combo there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. This has been uh, this has been great. Um, yeah, is is there anything else you'd uh, you'd like to say? I think we kind of said it all. We miss her. Yeah. And we'd like an end to come to this. Some closure. We'll never we'll never get over the loss, but it's better at least knowing. And why? Why? She said she would never put up a fight.